Pray with me. Father, we need to hear from you. We need a word from you. And if we don't hear from you, what will we do? Wanting you more each day, show us your perfect way. Because there is no other way that we can live. Speak, Lord. All your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're seven weeks from revival, at least from the meetings. And meetings don't guarantee revival. And revival can start before revival, and it can last after revival. But unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down, as the hymn says, all is vain. Unless God decides to do a work among his people. I thought about revivals that I've been a part of in the past. Uh, years ago, Calvin Miller came and preached at New Hope, where I served before I came here. I met him in his books, and then one week, I went to hear him at Glorietta, and nobody else showed up, almost nobody else. So I got to spend a whole week with him and read a book with him and think with him, and then I invited him to preach a revival at our church. And those of you who know Calvin know he had a way of sort of messing with your head. He would ask thought-provoking questions that would make you um, get confused and then try to change. And I think it was just part of what he was trying to do. And I remember when I picked him up from the airport the first time, and I was kind of nervous because he was a famous preacher, and, and I'm still not a famous preacher, but I certainly wasn't then. And so I was just driving him, and I started telling him about our church how we'd had 400 new members in the year before, we'd baptized 125 people, all these things that God had done. And I mean, I must have just bombarded him all the way through the barbecue at the restaurant. And finally, he waited for me to breathe. <laughs> and he said, so Duane, do you have a family? Do you have a wife? Do you have children? Because all you talk about is what God is doing at your church. And I wonder if God is doing anything in your family. And I took note of what he had said. And some months later when he came to preach the revival, I picked him up at the airport and I did not make the same mistake again. I talked about Melanie until I was blue in the face. I talked about Graham and Chase and all that God was doing. And when I came up for air, he said, Dwayne, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And he said, do you still love Jesus? You used to talk about Jesus all the time, and now you all, all you talk about is your family. And I knew at that point that with Calvin Miller, you could never win. You could just never win. Whatever you did, he was going to seek balance in your life. But I have pondered that question this week. For somebody to ask you, do you, for instance, if one of your friends said to you, do you still love Jesus, an assumption is made that at least in some point in your life, you did love Jesus, and that something might have changed. Do you? Just between us, do you still Love Jesus? Open your Bibles with me, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We're reading somebody else's mail in these seven weeks. For seven weeks, we'll look at seven churches. We're going to pray on Wednesday nights for the next seven weeks. And at the end of our prayer meeting, we're going to end early at 6.30, and we're going to walk around the campus in the air conditioning, at least at the beginning and we're gonna pray for our church that God will bring down any walls and strongholds that prevent us. And then on Thursdays, we're gonna meet in the chapel if you're available at lunchtime. And even if you're not here, you could do this wherever you are. We're gonna fast Thursday lunch and pray for revival. 
in our church. These are ways you can be involved. Let's stand together, hear the word of the Lord. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Ephesus was called the Lumen Asia because when you came up to its coastline, to its harbor, there were long lines of lights welcoming you. It was at the crossroads of three different trade routes, so it became, it wasn't the capital city of the province of Asia, but it was the biggest city. And it was, it was cultured, it was wealthy, and it was corrupt. And in that place, if you remember, Paul tried to get there before God was ready for him to get there. And God literally put up a stop sign and said, you're not going there now. But there came a day when God allowed him to go to Ephesus. And for two years, he taught there. And from that city, the gospel went out all over Asia. If they had a little hallway like our hallway with the pictures of our pastors the four pastors you might have seen on the hallway of the church in Ephesus would have been Paul, who founded the church, Apollos, who preached at the church, Timothy, who was at the church when Paul wrote 1 Timothy to him, and, oh yes, the Apostle John, who probably spent 25 years of his ministry in Ephesus. They did not lack for good leadership. And maybe because John had been there the longest, the church took on some of his characteristics. Remember, before Jesus got hold of him, John was a son of thunder. There might be a son or daughter of thunder in the room today. God chose John and James and worked in John. And John had a a, a clear sense of what was right and wrong. So when that little Samaritan village told Jesus he couldn't come in, he said, so may I call down the lightning bolt to incinerate the town? And Jesus said, no, you may not. But he became the disciple whom Jesus loved. And mark this, people who know that they are loved learn how to love and John becomes this disciple of love so can you imagine he's in exile on Patmos because of the gospel and there on the Lord's day he has a vision of Jesus like he has never seen him before his eyes like fire his hair white as snow his feet like brass his voice like a waterfall his countenance like lightning. And Jesus comes to him and he falls on his face and Jesus puts his hand on him and says, I need to dictate some letters to you to churches, to seven churches, seven 
real churches, seven representative churches, churches that are like some churches today. None of these churches, as I perceive it, you may see it differently, is exactly like Tallowood, but there are people here today, including me, for whom this passage is not just a matter of um, observation, but a matter of conviction. Don't look as we read these letters for which church is just like, just opposite of you so that you can say, yeah, that church really had a problem. I'm not like that. Look for the church that is most like you and listen to what Jesus says. And Jesus looks at the church at Ephesus and as is the pattern in these letters, there are some commendations and then there's concern and then there's a command and then there are consequences. And two of the churches really don't have a lot of problems, the church in Smyrna and Philadelphia. And, and two of the churches look like they're in a lot of trouble, uh, Pergamum and Laodicea. And three of them are a mix, and he, Ephesus is one of those. A church, a church that is very diligent, that is vigilant with their doctrine, but has somehow left their first love. It is possible, by the way, to get a four point and miss the point. And the church at Ephesus struggled with love. Love for whom? Love for Christ, love for their neighbors, love within the fellowship, we don't know. Probably the answer is yes, because where love is lacking, it is, I think, lost first in relationship vertically with God, but then it inevitably affects the, affects the way that we see people. Remember, all of these churches were trying to proclaim Christ in an increasingly hostile, pagan world. They're fighting against a culture that's fighting against them. And the point of Revelation, just as a way of introduction, the point of Revelation is not that it's some roadmap for the future. But like the rest of the books of the New Testament, it's about becoming and making disciples, about persevering in difficult times. Scott McKnight captures it when he says, the book of Revelation, when read well, forms us into dissident disciples who discern corruptions in the world and in the church and a dissident is a person of hope who imagines a better future world and then begins to embody that world. Michael Gorman, Revelation is about faithful discipleship in the world. Jesus spoke to the churches then. He speaks to the churches now. He reveals himself as the sovereign Lord of the universe. And as John R. W. Stott said, by praise and censure, by warning and approval, Christ reveals what he wants his church to be like in all places at all times. And when the revival broke out at Asbury earlier this year, we as a church ask these questions. Why not here? Why not us? Why not now? And from this letter we learn that it's not enough just to be doctrinally accurate. We have to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. First, notice his commendations of them. This was a busy church. They worked hard. They were diligent, we might say. They worked hard. The word is copiao, copious labor but they didn't get exhausted. They just kept on keeping on while churches around them were coming and going, rising and falling. They were the church that persevered, that endured. They were patient. They were vigilant in doctrine. Nobody with false teaching dared come anywhere near the church in Ephesus. So see the commendations first. Christ commends the church, watch this, for its perseverance. We get that part for its intolerance. He commends them for their intolerance. I'm just reading what it says. He commends them for their hatred. Well, that's a strange thing to say. 
Why would he commend them for? Let's look at what he says. First, he commends their deeds, their hard work, their perseverance. It's a beehive of activity. They are busy for the Lord. You too? Working hard for Jesus. Be careful that your service to the Lord doesn't ultimately numb your love for the Lord. Notice that they persevered. They stayed with it. They kept on keeping on. This is a sign of a, of a strong church. We can admire perseverance and patience and endurance, all of these things. I think it was William Barclay who said, endurance is, is not just the ability to get through a difficult time, but it's to turn that hard thing into glory. I think the church at Ephesus did that. Like Moody, they might have said, I'm tired in the work, but I'm not tired of the work. Or like Robert Murray McChain, how sweet to work for God all day long and rest beneath his smile at night. Years ago in Australia, they had what they call an ultra marathon. It's not just, you know, you see the little stickers on people's cars, 26.2. I did that uh, once myself. And uh, I was grateful I had the health to do it and was sorry I destroyed my health in a single day. But, but 26.2 miles, no, this is several of those marathons. And all the great runners of Australia lined up so that they could run this race of some 500 miles. And the winner was a guy named Cliff Young. He was 61 years old. He ran in galoshes and work clothes. And when he showed up at the starting line, everybody started laughing. But five days later, when he was the first to finish the race, nobody was laughing then. And it wasn't a close race. His nearest competitor was nine hours behind him. The others ran for 17 hours and then would sleep for seven hours. Not Cliff. He just kept on running. He kept on running till he won the race. I think this is a picture of endurance, of perseverance, and we admire that kind of persistence. You think about that person. I preached a revival at Little Bahala Creek Baptist Church in Little Bahala Creek, Mississippi one time, outside of Jackson, not far from Coalin, Kapaya Lincoln uh, Community College there, uh, junior college, and there was a guy there who had taught Sunday school in his church for 75 years. Is that a long time? That seems like a long time. Endurance is beautiful. He also commends the Ephesian church for their intolerance and their hatred. We say, wait a minute, what are you, what are you talking about? He says, you will not tolerate those who are false prophets and apostles, claim to be apostles but are not, you won't have anything to do with them. They did not lack, again, I point out their sort of wall of uh, pastors, Paul and Apollos and Timothy and John, they did not lack for good teaching. The problem there was not. When the Nicolaitans tried to come in with their teaching about immorality and idolatry and say these things are okay, it didn't take hold in Ephesus the way it did, for instance, in Pergamum because they had a wall, they had a, a firewall against bad doctrine. Remember Paul had said in Acts chapter 20 when he addressed the Ephesian elders some 35, 40 years before, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Jesus in Matthew 7, 15 warned. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Who were the Nicolaitans in verse 6? We don't know a lot. There was a Nicolaus who was one of those first uh, leaders in the early church in Jerusalem. Did he go out and did he cause? They are identified with the teachings of Balaam who tried to tempt Israel with idolatry and immorality. Just a reminder to us in our day and age with the proliferation of pornography that idolatry and immorality are alive and well in our world. We are bombarded with images, inundated with, with ideas. And I remember what Spurgeon said so many years ago, if I have wickedness brought before me by others, I will turn away from it. 
I will not gaze upon it with pleasure. Not only shall it not dwell in my heart, but not even before my eyes, for what fascinates the eye is very apt to gain admission into the heart. You know what I love about the church in Ephesus? They hated what Jesus hated. Notice Jesus, you said Jesus doesn't hate anything. No, he hates sin. And by the way, I hate my sin. Do you hate your sin? And if you don't hate your sin, why don't you hate your sin? Thomas Watson in his book on repentance that is being used by one of our young adult Sunday school classes, one of our young adult connect groups, that book says we need to see sin for what it is and eventually we need not only to confess sin, but we need to hate sin and turn from sin. Just to be clear, this doesn't mean that we hate sinners. This doesn't mean that we're trying to control Sinners, which is kind of a narrative in our culture. I saw this this week. Maybe you can identify with this. Many in our world reject our idea that we can love them but hate their sin. Uh, this I saw on, on uh, Twitter this week or X or whatever they're calling it now. Uh, a secular person says, I want to do X, whatever, behavior. And a Christian says, well, you're free to do that. And the secular person says, but you think X is wrong. And the Christian says, yeah, I think that's wrong. And the secular person says, because you want to control me. And the Christian says, no, you're free to do whatever you wish. But you still think my behavior is wrong. Yeah, but only because God wants what is best for you. But I want to do X. I want to do my bad behavior. Well, you're free to do it, says the Christian. But I want you to say that my bad behavior is good. And the Christian says, well, I can't say that. And then the secular person says, so why are you such a hateful, intolerant bigot? These conversations are happening all around us, all the time. Just to be clear, we're not asking a non-Christian world to act Christian. We're just saying we, as for us in our house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so we're going to do what's right and love those who are not doing what is right. But at no point are we going to say that wrong is right or that right is wrong. We're not going to do that because we answer to a higher authority. Jude chapter Jude verses 22 and 23, it doesn't have any chapters, does it? Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. That's why Wesley said, give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin, desire nothing but God, and I don't care a straw whether they're clergymen or laymen, such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. The believers in Ephesus were long on truth, praise God. On the other hand, he says in verse four, they were short on love. So after the commendations come the concerns, and the concern is this. He says, I have just one thing. He doesn't have 15 things against them. Like when we get to Laodicea, it's a long list. But this list is pretty short. You've left your first love, that's one translation of it. You've left the love you had at first. Somebody said their theology was as clear as ice and just as cold. And churches can be like that. Oswald Chambers said, beware of anything that competes with loyalty. I would say love to Jesus Christ. And the greatest competitor of devotion to Jesus is service for him. We can allow the work we're doing for Christ to destroy the work of Christ in us. There's a long list of people who let that happen. Notice the concerns. Christ confronts the church for leaving the love they had at first. Notice it's a choice they made. It wasn't passive. It's not something that happened to them. You know where we say, I just don't know how this happened to me. No, it was something they did. They chose. They forsook. So other translations, the Christian uh, standard or Christian, the CSB, uh, abandoned the love you had at first. NIV, we just read, forsaken the love you had at first. New American Standard Bible, NASB, you have left your first love. The ESV, you've abandoned the love you had at first. The message, Eugene Peterson, you've walked away from your first love. And here's the thing about the church in Ephesus. They should have known how to love. Why do I say that? Because the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, says to them in chapter five, he says to them, as dearly loved children live lives of love. Follow God's example. He loved you. 
you too should love. It reminds me of, of Jeremiah chapter 2 when the Lord is speaking to his people and says, I want you to go back to the devotion you had at first. I get to do weddings sometimes. It's one of the, the joys of my life. And, and I see these young couples and I see the love in their eyes and I am so delighted by that and I'm grateful for the love they have for each other. There's so much devotion and love. And we also know that love like a good garden, must be cultivated. It must be maintained. It, it can't be left to itself because love grows cold. So Jesus warns that in Matthew 24, in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. Don't let it happen to you. Maybe if nothing else came out of these revival services you and I could come back to the place where we love God first. He has the primary place in our lives. We love him more than anything else. We live to love him. I remember Tim Shepard singing when I was a college student, now I live to love you with the warmness of a summer. I live to love you, God. Or Keith Green confessed for me and for all of us when he sang, my eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. Oh, what can be done for an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. And when our hearts grow hard and cold, we need to be revived. When we're busy for God and we understand the truth and we forsake sin in others, but our own love for God has grown cold, we need revival. We need renewal. We need God to do a fresh work in our lives. And the good news is he can. You know where I run in Hershey Park, the the, the ground has been parched. Early in the week, I said to my staff, I said, when we want God as much as that dirt wants water, then we will have revival. Later in the week, Melanie and I were watching TV, eating supper, and she said, I think it's raining outside. I said, I don't think it's raining outside because my app says it's not going to rain for the next 462 days. <laughs> I know it's not raining. I mean, I got in my car last week after lunch. I've been miserable. You know, I spent a lot of time outside. It's been kind of hard to do that this summer. And I looked at my, at my little dial there in my car, you know, my little uh, 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 dashboard there, and, and I said, look, it's 142 degrees. <laughs> Melanie said, no, it's 142 in the afternoon. <laughs> I was glad she was right, because if she wasn't right, Later that day, when I came out of the gym, it was 347 degrees. <laughs> it's felt that way, hasn't it? And then that little bit of rain fell that night. I heard thunder. It was kind of like, you know, it was kind of like Elijah seeing the little cloud the size of a man's fist and says, run, it's about to rain. Our dogs came inside and it poured for like 15 minutes or so. I'm not bragging, I'm just observing. And what happened was, the next day when I went out into the park, the ground was soft for the first time in months. I want that to happen to me. I want that to happen to you. That God would send the latter rains, that we would not find ourselves like the people in Jeremiah's day saying, summer's over, harvest is ended, and we're still not saved. We're still not okay. And so what does he do? He he calls them, Christ calls the church to return to love. In fact, you can just kind of summarize it. He says, remember, first, remember how far you've fallen. Remember, can you remember a time? This is a simple song that we sing. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. So again, just between us, did you ever love Jesus more than you do now? What would it take for you to remember Repent simply means to turn. What would it mean for you to return to the deeds you did at first? You know, as we said when we were studying Malachi, God has not moved. He's right where he's always been, and he says, return to me. 
come back home. I think about the prodigal son. His life changed when he remembered. In Luke 15, he said he remembered his father's house, how the servants were treated there, and said, it'd be better to be a servant in my father's house. And he goes home, and he's got this well-rehearsed speech, but he never gets to give his dad the speech because his dad is too busy loving him putting a ring on his finger. God wants us to return more than we want to return. And if we are willing to come back to him, if we are willing with that hymn to say, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies. Can we just agree today that sin is folly? For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious redeemer, my savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. What happens to a church that continues to love God, that, that remembers what they did before, repents of sin, and returns to God? What happens in our lives when that happens? Oh, he says, you enter the paradise of God and you eat from the tree. The curse is reversed. God begins to do a new work in your life through his Holy Spirit, and they remembered a time when those Ephesians, when they turned from idolatry, they turned from it. They burned the books. They had a public burning. They got rid of every, every last vestige of their old sin. When Jacob comes back to Bethel, he says, bury the idols. Nothing will be more important to us than God, and that is the place we have to get to. You may remember a time when you turned to God. I remember a revival when I was a teenager, and I was playing football. The one year of my life, I played football, and I just remember we had a revival right in the middle of, uh, I was trying to make the Rhine-Mine Mustangs football team, and, and we were right in the middle of that, and we are having revival, and they're having practices and all that, and in the middle of that meeting, I didn't make the Mustangs, if you were wondering. I ended up playing for the Vikings, which was the lower tier team but I'll tell you this in that revival meeting one night God called me back to himself and it was within a year that I surrendered to preach and I began to preach and it started this is why I think we need a revival that we come to the place where we say I'm not going back to the way it was I'm coming. what happens in a church like that so years ago choir some of you remember how many of you were in Spain in Sevilla Spain just raise your hand I would have thought a lot more. Okay, so that was a long time ago. I've been here a long time. That dates me a little bit. But we went to Spain and Portugal, and our choir sang in these fantastic, beautiful cathedrals of Europe. We went into one that used to be a cathedral, and our choir broke out into spontaneous song. And the person who was running the museum that used to be the church came in and quieted them down. We don't sing to God. Are you kidding me? They built this room to sing to God. Yeah, but we don't do that anymore. It's just a museum now. It's just a museum. Later in the week, after being in all these fantastic cathedrals, Melanie and I went over early and we saw the Notre Dame. We, we went to all these amazing, amazing, beautiful cathedrals. And then later in the week, we found there was a little, I don't know if any of you remember this, there was this little uh, Iglesia Bautista Evangelica, the Evangelical Baptist Church. The pastor was Elton Rongel. He grew up in Brazil, in Recife, and God had called him as a missionary from Brazil, by the way, where they speak Portuguese, to go to Sevilla, Spain. And they had planted a church there. And that church, it was amazing. It was made out of cinder block walls. There was no stained glass that I can remember at all. But there were sort of wires dangling from the ceiling. They were still trying to get the lights put in. And there on one wall, there was Second Chronicles. There was a quote from Second Chronicles, I think in chapter 2. The temple we are building is greater than the other temples because our God is greater than their gods. And nobody, nobody would have said, our God is greater than all the other gods. Nobody would have said, oh, oh, what a magnificent building you have. But I'll tell you about that little church. It's still going. I checked on the internet last night, and people are coming to Christ there. It is offering life. It's not as beautiful as some of the other buildings, but what's beautiful is the church that meets in that building. And the truth is, Jesus says, if the church doesn't experience revival and renewal, there will come a time as he walks among the churches and he knows our hearts and he knows our lives that one day he just says, 
yeah, you're done. You're done. And I remember when I went to Ephesus years ago, it's the most magnificent archaeological dig I've ever seen in my life. It's fantastic the way those people lived. Uh, they, they have a coliseum, uh, an amphitheater that seats 45,000 people. It's phenomenal. But when the sun goes down, there's no light in Ephesus. There's no church in Ephesus. There's nothing but just the remains. And the beauty of what God wants to do among his people is in here. So he's given us beautiful buildings, and I thank God for them as I walk and pray. We're going to do it Wednesday night. But I'll tell you what I really love about this church is your faces. The people that God, some days I, I, I literally say to myself, are you kidding me? I get to be pastored to these people. One who explained to me how God had done a new work in her life. It was back about Easter of this, this year when she was uh, in a display in another church where she works in our city and she was looking at this and God gave her a vision that Jesus died on the cross for her and she felt conviction for her sins and she said that was a turning point in my life and now I want to be baptized and this is the truth this is the kind of work God is going to do among us and all I wanted to know was have you ever loved Jesus Jesus and if you ever did, do you still love Jesus? Because if you do, you will love the people he loves, and God will do something new among us as we serve him together. Pray with me. Father, I thank you that you're going to do something so great among us that we'll know it was you. In fact, Lord, we're not gonna settle for anything less than that because we believe you're able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Lord, honestly, our eyes are dry. Our faith is old. Our hearts are hard and our prayers are cold. Lord, would you soften our hearts by the oil of your spirit would you wash us anew in the wine of your blood so that we leave this place today whiter than snow because you have washed us and made us new. We dare to ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.